daughter charged with killing her own mother. Investigators say that Sydney Powell stabbed her mother multiple times inside their Akron home. She's pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, and today we... Well, hello there. My name's Brooke, and I enjoy researching strange occurrences, true crime, conspiracy theories, etc., and sharing my findings with you. If those are the types of things that you're into, well, then you've come to the right place. Let me ask you something. Have you ever found yourself in an embarrassing situation? Lord knows I have. And you just can't imagine anybody that matters to you finding out, because what if they lose respect for you? What if they make fun of you? Many people tell little white lies here and there, especially when it comes to saving face. But would you ever resort to murder in order to protect your own ego? Well, of course you wouldn't, because I'd like to assume that you're a decent human being who realizes that nothing is ever truly that serious. We're all just along for the ride, and we all make mistakes. Unfortunately, not everybody fits that same bill, though, which is unfortunately what brings me here today to tell you a little bit about the case of Sydney Powell. Sydney Nicole Powell was born on March 20 first, 2000, to her parents Stephen and Brenda Powell. Sydney had a pretty typical upbringing in Akron, Ohio, and while neighbors of the Powell family weren't extremely close by any means, they shared that neighborly relationship where they watched Stephen and Brenda settle into family life over the years and become pretty involved parents. This was back in the day when most kids didn't have free reign on technology and the internet and actually went out into nature and used their imaginations for entertainment, and Sydney's parents were happy to be a part of that as she grew up. Sydney went to high school at a private Catholic school called St. Vincent's where she was an excellent student. She was no stranger to the honor roll and made sure to participate in extracurriculars like soccer and lacrosse to beef up her college applications. In 2018, Sydney graduated from St. Vincent's High School and was so grateful to find out that she had been granted a full-ride presidential scholarship to study psychology at Mount Union University, which is a pretty big deal considering it is one of the nation's highest honors for students to receive, as only 161 people receive it every year. Mount Union was only about an hour away from the Powell's hometown of Akron, which Sydney was excited about at first. She was becoming a young adult, she finally had some freedom and distance from her parents for the first time in her life, yet it was still within a reasonable distance to drive back during the holidays and breaks in her classes. She still enjoyed staying in touch with her family and mainly did so with her mother Brenda. At Mount Union University, Sydney decided to join a sorority, which wasn't too difficult considering she was a very sociable person and seemed to keep up a good appearance. It wasn't long before the once star student started really struggling in her education. It's not that she wasn't intelligent, obviously. I mean, she just received an honorable scholarship for her dedication to her studies. If I had to guess, Sydney's focus on school shifted to her social life when she was granted independence and her her grades started slipping. Slipping so much, in fact, that the deans at Mount Union called in a meeting with Sydney to let her know that particularly due to her full-ride scholarship, which was funding the entirety of her education, she was placed on academic probation for not upholding her end of this opportunity. But during this probation period, Sydney ended up not taking it seriously enough to make any actual improvements in her grades. Ultimately, she failed the second chance, and in December of 2019, she was in informed that she was being dismissed for the upcoming 2020 spring semester. She would, however, be able to reapply the following fall semester. Sydney surprisingly took this news in stride and signed a document acknowledging the fact that she was no longer considered a student enrolled at the university. That kind of sounds like a good thing at first. Maybe this setback is actually just an opportunity to reevaluate her priorities and try again in the upcoming year. Happens to the best of us, right? Well, turns out not, because instead of admitting to anyone, whether it be friends or family, that she had failed out of college, Sydney kept up a complete facade that everything was going swimmingly. When she returned home for winter break, she told her family about how her social life was thriving, she was studying diligently to keep up her grades as she always had, and her scholarship definitely wasn't in complete jeopardy or anything. At the end of winter break with the 2020 spring semester just around the corner, Sydney prepares to return to her dorm on 
campus as if nothing was wrong. She reunited with her roommate Lauren and the two caught up with Lauren completely unaware that Sydney was no longer a student and therefore not even supposed to be in their shared dorm room. And Sydney, of course, wanting to keep this situation as undercover and normal seeming as possible, continued life as a regular student. She would head out and pretend like she was going to class, eat the school's food, and use all of their resources as she had been previously. And you may be thinking, how did this go unnoticed? And that is a completely valid thought to have because unlike so many cases I cover where everyone seems to be missing obvious red flags, the school did in fact catch on quickly considering this was affecting them financially. If there's one thing a private institution is going to do, it is take you for every penny you're worth. Kidding kind of. It was overall just really strange to them too, considering during the meeting where they broke the news of her disenrollment, Sydney didn't seem surprised, upset, or like she would give any pushback on their decision, and she seemed like she had an understanding and was going to comply. Yet here she was the next semester acting completely brand new. She really said, I am going to live out my delusions and manifest them into reality and nobody is gonna stop me. So throughout the entirety of January and most of February, the deans of the school held several meetings with Sydney, asking why she was still hanging out around campus and literally living there as if she hadn't lost her scholarship and wasn't paying a dime of room or board or tuition anymore. Sydney basically admits, all right, you caught me. I'll start moving out. But spoiler alert, she doesn't. The school administration at this point then has to threaten to get Sydney's parents involved if she doesn't pack her things and go because it's getting very weird at this point if it wasn't already. The welcome has definitely been worn out and she's gotta go. Sydney tells the administrators not to even bother speaking with her parents because she claims to have already told them about everything already. Yet another spoiler alert, she didn't. Her family had no clue that anything was amiss with their star student daughter. And Sydney being stuck in this giant lie between her school, her family, and her friends decides that she just can't admit the truth of the matter to her loved ones. I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth, but I can only infer that Sydney going from what may be considered a well-liked and gifted child to fumbling a full-ride scholarship as a result of her newfound independence would be a hard pill to swallow. I think a lot of us have experienced situations like this, albeit far more reasonable and rational, when you become an adult and you're like, oh wow, I actually have responsibilities and consequences, and the consequences are a lot more serious now that I'm not a kid. And instead of taking this mistake and turning it into a lesson, Sydney was not able to accept this defeat. She had never even worried about defeat in academics before. It was what she had always been good at. Surely she would find a way around this, right? Well, on February 24th of 2020, after being told to leave campus three different times, Sydney realizes that she cannot avoid the inevitable any longer, so here she has yet another wide open opportunity to finally come clean, but as I'm sure you can assume by me making this video in the first place, it doesn't end here. No not even close. Sydney decides to tell her roommate Lauren and her sorority sisters that she and her parents have been discussing her academic career and decided that it would ultimately be best for her to take some time away from school to deal with personal issues. This stretch from the truth may have bought her some time with her friends, but Sydney's dad Stephen on the other hand was back home in Akron getting a little suspicious. Stephen starts to realize that he has more money in his bank account than expected and while I'm sure that was great at first. I'm sure he was thrilled. He was very confused upon looking further into this and seeing that he hadn't been charged by the university for a couple months. He tries logging into the school's portal to check the financial statements as he had done many times before, only to find out that he was unable to access the account. Stephen then contacts his daughter, explaining the problems that he's having and asked if she had any information, but she just claims it must have been a mistake on the school's part and and that she will go into the financial aid office in person to get everything straightened out. I don't even have to tell you, but we all know that this of course did not happen, just like everything else that Sydney has presented to her loved ones. Anything involving administration and especially finances can come with a lot of irritation and miscommunication, so Sydney's parents didn't really think a whole lot of it initially and believed her. But what did start to catch their attention was the fact that Sydney had started coming back 
back home on random afternoons when she would usually only previously return for special occasions or holidays. It was especially strange that she was just hanging out there at times where she should have been at class. When her parents questioned her about it, she would just tell them that class had been canceled that day or that she didn't really need to physically be there. So with this, Sydney recognizes that her lies are getting pretty sloppy at this point and that her parents are beginning to get a bit suspicious. So she does the only other thing she can think of and starts spending most of her time either hanging out on campus during the day or booking hotel rooms to sleep in at night since she has no dorm to go to and can't explain to her parents why that is. Can we just take a moment to reflect on how much effort Sydney is putting in to keep up this lie? Like it almost seems to me like it would be less stress and less work and less sneaking around to just tell the truth than to keep this up. And while I understand her actions are probably coming from a place of shame, making a mistake and taking a semester off of school was far from the end of the world, even if it may have felt like it for her. But Sydney continues acting like she's in good academic standing with her parents as spring break approaches. On March 2nd, Sydney contacted her mother Brenda and said that after class the next day, she would be returning home for spring break. That same evening, she then went to watch The Bachelor with her ex-roommate Lauren and some of their friends, as the group normally did each Monday night. The following morning on Monday, March 3rd, Stephen Powell is at work and he's really caught up on the fact that these charges have not been posted to his bank account by Mount Union, and Sydney keeps saying that she's going to handle it, but he figures he should just finally take things into his own hands. Stephen calls the financial aid office at Mount Union and pretty quickly discovers that Sydney had actually been disenrolled at the end of the previous semester. Of course, he's in shock because he had had these suspicions in the back of his mind for a while now, but to actually hear confirmation that his star student of a daughter had not only been placed on academic probation, but basically kicked out temporarily, he was left with a lot of questions. He had never found her to be untruthful in the past, so he was understandably bewildered, to say the least. For one, what has Sydney been doing and where has she been going these past few months while claiming that she's in class. So Steven proceeds to check the Life360 app on his phone, which for those who are unfamiliar is basically like a location sharing service mainly used by families. He saw in the app that despite her plan to be returning home that evening after class, Sydney was already heading back home early that morning. Wanting to get to the bottom of this unbelievable revelation, Steven leaves his phone at work just in case Sydney he happens to be watching his location too, and he drives home to confront her once and for all. But upon arriving home and catching Sydney red-handed, not where she's supposed to be, she is quick to come up with the excuse that she actually is enrolled in school, but she's decided that she doesn't like going and is having second thoughts about her future. Probably still wanting to believe that this is all just a misunderstanding and that his daughter hasn't been pathologically lying to him for months, Stephen tells Sydney that he understands her feelings and that they will all get together as a family to figure things out. He reassured her that they would support her taking a break from her education as long as she had an actual plan and aspirations for her future. Stephen and Brenda both had college degrees and they wanted their daughter to have similar opportunities to live a comfortable and relatively successful life. So Stephen calls Brenda to get her up to speed on the situation, to which Brenda responds by leaving her job of 20 eight years as a child life specialist at the Akron Children's Hospital. Now, regrettably, Stephen actually left home to return to work before Brenda was able to make it there, and he wasn't able to see Brenda for what would be the unexpected last time. Once arriving home, Brenda makes a call to Mount Union University at 2.15 p.m. saying that she'd like to speak with the deans in order to discuss her daughter's education and figure out how everyone will be moving forward. At this time, the deans were in a meeting, but their secretary did tell Brenda that she would take a message and that they would give her a call back. At 12.26 p.m., Brenda texted Stephen, giving him a heads up that she had contacted the school and was waiting back on a response. Not long later, the deans of the university make that return phone call, to which Brenda answers by introducing herself. The deans reciprocate, and Brenda thanks them for getting back to her so quickly. All very normal and expected at first, until the call was abruptly ended by a loud thud on Brenda's end of the line, screaming, and then the 
line was left completely empty. At this point, the deans are obviously like, hello? What, what just happened? But each and every time that they try to call Brenda back, there's no answer. After three tries, they were momentarily relieved when their call was picked up, but pretty quickly realized that something still wasn't quite right here. The person on the other end of the line sounded very suspiciously just like Sydney, and it wasn't hard for the deans to recognize her voice considering the many meetings they had had with her over the last several months concerning her unwarranted presence on campus. When the deans pointed out that they knew who was really on the other end of the call, Sydney immediately immediately hung up as she knew she had been caught. The deans continued to feel very uneasy about what had just happened and made the smart decision to contact the police department. And can I just take a moment to acknowledge the fact that somebody involved in a true crime case finally recognized a giant red flag and did the correct thing for once? Because I swear, see something, hear something, say something. Like somebody, anybody, please. When this call came into the police department, one of the officers who was very familiar with the community and was actually friends with Stephen Powell, called to ask if he was aware that authorities had been dispatched to his home. Stephen is once again unexpectedly the recipient of some shocking news finding this out since he had returned to work and thought that everything was beginning to be handled. So Stephen attempts calling both Brenda and Sydney with no response from either of them initially. A little while later though, Sydney does return her father's call and says that everything was fine and that Brenda Brenda was on the phone with her university. Stephen is once again just completely lost and tells her that the police are apparently on their way to the house, but he doesn't know why. Sydney very abruptly goes from one to 100, crying hysterically on the phone and blurts out that somebody had broken into their house and then just abruptly hung up. To this, Stephen rushes home from work for the second time that day. Police arrive on the scene around the same time and as expected, knock on the front door, because they have no idea what's going on and this is just a welfare check as far as they're concerned. But when the officers start hearing screaming coming from inside, followed by Sydney finally answering the door, it was quite the sight. When opening the door, officers saw a hysterical Sydney screaming, crying, acting very erratically, and perhaps the most disturbing thing was that they noticed that she was covered in blood. Sydney proceeded to rattle off a story about how somebody had broken into the family's home and that her mother had told her to run. At this point, the officers aren't getting the full picture of what Sydney is trying to tell them because she just keeps repeating these two details. Somebody broke in and her mom told her to run. That's it. So she is acting so out of sorts that the officers just have to proceed to assess the situation and piece together the chaos themselves. That is when the cops enter Brenda and Stephen's bedroom and find the disturbing scene of Brenda laying on the floor, nearly dead, covered in blood. Next to her almost lifeless body, they noticed both a cast iron skillet and a steak knife on the floor. While Brenda was on the phone with the deans, 19-year-old Sydney went to the kitchen to retrieve these tools to be used as weapons, coming back and hitting her mother in the head and neck repeatedly with the cast iron skillet and then proceeding to stab her with the steak knife. 30 times. Brenda was transported to the nearest hospital as soon as possible, but unfortunately, this woman who was described as a caring and compassionate person, especially to the children and family she worked with, would pass away shortly after her arrival. Upon further investigation of the crime scene, police found that one of the windows in the house was indeed smashed, which would have supported Sydney's story of an intruder, except for the fact that the glass had clearly been broken from the inside of the house. So it was no surprise when they also discovered that Sydney had many small cuts on herself that resembled the results of glass shattering near skin. Sydney was of course arrested, but the thing about this entire case is that it wasn't a question of whether or not Sydney murdered Brenda because all of the signs basically point to her so glaringly. I don't think for a second that anyone truly believed that this was the work of a home invader or quite frankly, anyone who wasn't Sydney. 
Sydney. During her interrogation by police and eventually mental health professionals, Sydney recalled her version of events that evening. She said that she and Brenda were both downstairs when they heard glass break, but that she had blacked out and when she came to, realized that she was stabbing her mother over and over again in the throat. So as you can probably guess, Sydney attempted to blame her horrific actions on her mental state, which she claims led to murder, felonious assault, and tampering with evidence. She was sent for extensive psychological evaluation leading up to her trial, but in the meantime, Sydney was actually free because she posted her $50,000 bond. This next part initially came as pretty shocking to me, and it might to you as well, but pretty much all of the Powell relatives showed up in September of this year to support not only Brenda, but Sydney too in court. They did not even want Sydney to be on trial for her actions. They wrote letters to the judge in favor of her character and assured the judge that they would support her no matter the final outcome. While this probably seems extremely strange and maybe even like a betrayal to Brenda, I can understand where the family may be coming from. This terrible situation just not only resulted in the death of their beloved Brenda, but now they were facing losing yet another family member to the legal system who could potentially lock her up and throw away the key. One of the doctors who worked with Brenda at the children's hospital even claimed that Brenda would have wanted her daughter to be in the least restrictive environment possible to receive mental treatment. While it's not necessarily that I don't believe this is true, a mother's love is one of the very few things that I think can be unconditional. I don't think that justified giving somebody a slap on the wrist just because her mom may have been a little more understanding of her daughter than let's say a random stranger. Let us not forget that Sydney literally killed her mother in a gruesome and almost certainly painful barbaric manner. During Sydney's trial, I think the state prosecutor did a great job of setting the scene of this crime in his opening statement. He acknowledged that Sydney's mistakes leading up to the murder could have been extremely shameful and embarrassing, which is what led her to pile up lies upon lies that she couldn't escape, but that there was really no justification for the murder. Sydney's defense held steadfast in their claims that she was not mentally stable during the time of her crime and that she actually hadn't been stable in about seven years. Sydney claimed that she had started having audible hallucinations around the age of 11 and that during the time of the murder, she was in the midst of a psychotic episode. Her lawyer said that the method of killing Brenda was so intimate and brutal that Sydney would have had to have been insane to carry out such actions. In her defense, a few psychologists were called to the stand in order to testify that Sydney was undoubtedly showing symptoms of depressive schizoaffective disorder and that she also showed signs of borderline personality and anxiety disorders. But not everybody was so convinced that this was true. The prosecution also utilized the words of professionals in their favor, calling psychiatrists to testify on the stand. And this move really worked in the state's favor because although people with schizophrenia often do see psychologists, psychiatrists are the main line of defense with this disorder since it does typically require medicinal intervention. The psychiatrist on the stand stated that it's extremely uncommon for a preteen girl to start showing symptoms of schizophrenia and that if she really did have them, it would have been difficult at her age to hide or recognize the social need to hide the behaviors. Sydney's lawyer responded to this by claiming that people probably did recognize that she was having hallucinations, but just chalked it up to being an imaginary friend since she was just a kid. He also claimed that she was suffering in silence so badly that it caused her to commit this atrocious crime, almost painting her as the victim in all of this. The state found that people who'd known Sydney well throughout her life said that while she did have some issues with anxiety in her younger days, they were nowhere near being a cause for concern and that she was still regarded as a social and successful girl most of her life. What was probably the biggest deciding factor in this whole case was that if Sydney was suffering from such a severe psychotic break, how did she manage to keep up her charades for so long and continuously make choices that were logically to her sole benefit? She kept everyone believing that everything was fine and that even when there was the slightest suspicion against her, she put thought into her next moves. This girl was literally living out of hotel rooms and basically homeless trying to keep up this lie that wasn't even that big of a deal relative to the outcome. If she was so 
out of her logical mind, then why did she go to the lengths that she did in order to hide things if she had no concept of right or wrong? So with that undeniable point, on September 28th, 23-year-old Sydney Powell was sentenced to 15 years with an additional three years, totaling 18 years behind bars. Sydney didn't hesitate to let the judge know that she would like an attorney to file a sentencing appeal, but at least until then, she doesn't have to lie about where she's going to be living anymore. All in all, I'm glad Sydney wasn't just given a slap on the wrist for reasons of insanity, but I just can't help but to feel as if justice was never truly an option. First off, because Brenda still had her life taken prematurely and selfishly by her daughter, and whether or not Brenda would forgive Sydney or not for her actions, that doesn't take away from the fact that she was found to be sane and completely capable of taking another person's life. When I first heard this case, it definitely reminded me a lot of Chandler Halder who, if you're not familiar, kept up an elaborate lie about his education and career, which eventually led to him murdering his parents and making it look like they went on a trip. Even his own girlfriend was unaware of his capability to do such a thing, yet he was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, he did kill both of his parents, but I thought it was an important comparison to make between these two cases. Well, that just about brings us to the end of today's video, and you already know the drill by now. Go ahead and leave any comments and thoughts down below that you have because I love to see them. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to learn about some true crime with me and I'll be sure to see you in the next one. Bye!